me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of allegiance to the, to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, which it stands one, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If we could stay standing for just a moment, I want to um, um, have a moment of silence for um, a Brockton High School a student who lost her life last week, um, Brianna uh, Christoph, uh, our hearts and prayers go out to her family and her loved ones and her friends, um, uh, a life lost much too young. So I just want to have a moment of silence for Brianna and her family. Thank you. Okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The, uh, the mayor, unfortunately, has a conflict this evening, and our uh, vice chair, Mark Diagostino, is recovering from an unexpected illness. So um, we will uh, carry on and try to do a good job in their absence. Second item on the agenda is the hearing of visitors. I've been informed that there are no visitors this evening. Is that correct? Yes, Thank you, Ms. Campbell, appreciate that. Third item on the consent agenda is the, um, third item on, on, on the agenda is the consent agenda. It is the regular bundling of school committee business. Any one of the school committee uh, members may uh, seek to remove any item listed. Is there any item or items that any school committee member would like to remove to talk about independently or bundled together? Good evening, Ms. Mendez. Which items would you like to remove? Good evening. I would like to remove G. And good evening, Ms. Azak. How I'd are like you? to remove um, F. F as in Frank. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Can I then have a um, <clears throat> motion to approve the remaining items, which is A, B, C, D, E, H, I, and J? Motion to approve A, B, C, D, E, H, I, and J. A second. 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 Thank you, Ms. Azak. Any further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. No, no. Unanimous. Ms. Mendez, the floor um, is yours. Thank you. So on September 29th um, at 6 o'clock, we met here for the first time on our subcommittee of equity, diversity, inclusion. Um, I was present, Mr. D'Agostino, Sullivan, Ms. Walder, Dr. Cobbs, and the subcommittee um, members, Mr. Minincello and Ms. Rodriguez. I was able to present Manuel Fernandez and Amina Pilgrim. Manuel Fernandez is a graduate of Brockton High. He also went to UMass Dartmouth, Dartmouth, and he has worked for the last 35 years as a school administrator and consults schools on issues related to race and equity. Amina Pilgrim works full time for UMass Dartmouth. She's been a professor for 20 years, specifically teaching African American studies, women's history, and critical ethnic studies. They both explained how they will provide the district with support on developing our Office of Equity, and they will give consistent professional development to the district, and they will work closely with the school committee. The superintendent then asked Manuel to give a brief description or elaborate more on the grant that was submitted to Nellie May. Nellie May um, is prepared to give Brockton Public Schools Department $250,000 for one year with a possibility of various years down the road, depending how things turn out to focus on. Um, depends on what things, uh, depends on the responses and the inequities around the pandemic and the work that the superintendent Thomas and his team has done establishing the equity office as well as providing staff with curriculum and instructional practices. On November 16, 2020, Amina and Manuel, they are scheduled to address all of the educators in the city of Brockton to begin the training. Um, and the, it, these trainings will take place on November, December, and January with representatives from all the schools. They will be participating 
And this could also, um, also the superintendent's team and the leadership team, as well as principals and assistant principals will also participate. So it's a whole district thing. Um, superintendent um, Thomas thanks Sharon Walder, chief officer of student support services and her team, Karen Watts, um, who's the grants director and putting the grant together and making it very, um, and having a quick turnaround. Um, I was able to discuss the five goals and timelines for the committee. There was a vote to approve from the committee having a two day, three hour series with Manuel and Amina. Mr. Minicello motion to move forward with regard to schedu scheduling the workshops. Um, just asking um, workshops, work setting the goals regarding developing policies and practices regarding the equity and this was seconded by Mr. Rodriguez. Um, it was suggested that we have uh, one student from Brockton High and two to three students from the alternative schools who will be informing, but they will be non-voting to be part of the subcommittee. And this hopefully will be done by December 2020. It was also recommended to have one teacher of color and one parent from each level. So from the elementary, middle, and high school level. Superintendent Thomas, uh, he suggested working with principals of each school level for recommendations of participants. Ms. Men, um, myself, I suggested creating an objective and visual asking for specific information for participation. A recommendation was made, was made that the committee should meet one or two times a month. Um, we then discussed the name change on the subcommittee to change it from diversity, to change it to diversity, race, equity, and inclusion. Mr. Menoncello asked for the clarification and I was able to provide that. Then Mr. Menoncello motioned to officially change the name to equity, um, to officially change the name, and this was seconded by Mr. Rodriguez. Um, I was then able to thank Superintendent Thomas for an invitation on Influence 100, which is specifically from DESI to increase the racial and ethnic diversity of the superintendents. The goal is to have 100 superintendents of color work for Massachusetts in the next four years. Um, thank you to Superintendent Thomas, Dr. Cobbs, Dr. Moran, and Ms. Walder from Brockton who are taking that role and that responsibility of being a leader. And then from there, we were able to adjourn and that was seconded by Mr. Menoncello. The meeting ended at 6.42 p.m. Very good. Um, certainly an accurate summary of the evening's events. Um, would you now <clears throat> care to make a motion to approve the minutes? Yes, I would like to make a motion to approve um, the minutes of September 29, 2020 of the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Subcommittee meetings. Second. Any further discussion on that motion? All in favor? Okay. Um, the second piece of that, um, Ms. Mendez, would be that now that the minutes have been approved, um, the school committee um, would now have to take a vote to change the name. Um, so do you want to do that now or would you like to do that in unfinished business? Melinda, unfinished business or can we vote it under the report of the subcommittee for the name change? We should do it now. Yeah. Now. Okay, so I, why don't you make a motion then uh, at this point to change the name and then if any of the school committee members have questions they certainly can ask okay I would like to make a motion to change the name of our subcommittee from equity diversity and inclusion to specifically um, diversity diversity race equity and inclusion we would need a second second okay now further discussion any discussion on the motion so if people have questions or would like clarification they can at this point ask Mr. Sullivan. Not a question, but I just wanted to make a statement that your summary was fabulous. It was almost word for word. I couldn't believe it. You're unbelievable. Thank you. I don't know how you wrote it all down so quick. I felt like I was talking too much, but thank you. <laughs> it was nice. It was really nice. I don't think you left nothing unturned. <laughs> Thanks, Sully. <laughs> That's all. Thank you. Anyone else? She's been watching you, Sully. She pays attention. <laughs> Uh, seeing no further questions or comments, uh, all in favor? Okay, that passes unanimously. 
Okay, now we go to Ms. Azak. You wanted to talk about item F. Thank you. Um, so on September 25th, the Facilities Usage and Planning Subcommittee met, and we had a few items to review. Um, let's see what we have here. So um, everyone was present. I was president. I was present. Uh, our chair, Mr. Diagostino, and Mr. Sullivan, and Superintendent Thomas. Um, we reviewed different items. Uh, one of them was the polling location request we received from um, Ms. Cynthia Scrivani, our executive director in the elections department. They were requesting to uh, move around some of the polling locations. Two of them uh, in, in question were one at the Russell School and the other one at the Gilmore School. Uh, they're going to be going to the high rises. Um, that was voted on unanimously uh, by all, all the subcommittee members. The next item we have, we had Dr. Cobbs present. Um, he presented on air quality and air exchange reports, air purifiers, PPE, cleaning and disinfecting procedures. Um, and he pretty much went through everything that our facilities department has been doing to help everyone get back to the schools. Superintendent uh, Thomas had mentioned that Dr. Cobbs Ken Thompson, Jamie Domestico, and the entire facilities department has done an amazing job getting our buildings ready for the return of teachers, staff, administrators. A lot of work was put into their air quality and air exchange. Uh, department of Education and Department of Public Health put out guidance recommendation, recommend, recommending using standards due to the COVID pandemic for air exchange. Every building was tested except for buildings that have radiators and we only have two of those. We have the Keith Center and the Huntington. Um, he gave us a very detailed report, and it was uh, well informed, well informed our committee. Um, see what else we have here? We are scheduled to do a walkthrough of, this, of the North Middle School uh, to take a look at the renovations. So we haven't scheduled that as of yet. Um, but once again, I mean, I know Dr. Cobbs had presented. But we just want to thank our facilities department for just working, um, getting us all back back to schools at, at certain points, um, keeping our buildings clean, and going through and helping um, throughout this COVID pandemic. So, if anyone has any questions, I think we should be good. Just Mr. Point. Sullivan, I, I wasn't that detailed, Mr. Sullivan. <laughs> I got to take notes from Miss uh, Mendez. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I just wanted to thank. I'm going to thank Dr. Cobb, but I'm not sure who, who did that booklet. Uh, Joyce, you, the, the thing had it was to very be, impressive. Had to be four inches thick. It took me a whole week to read the thing. <laughs> very impressive. They did they did do a lot of detailed work for us. As always, they always keep us informed. Um, you know, everyone's there's a lot of behind the scenes that a lot of people don't know about, and our facilities department is one of those departments. Our custodians and our facilities department um, constantly just you know keeping everyone safe and doing what they need to do, um, learning the new way of life as far as what we need to do for our buildings. It just it was a real thorough job. No, Excellent. thank you again, Dr. Cobbs. Very nice presentation. Um, if anyone has any questions, they can always reach out to me personally. I have the book. It's very impressive, um, all the information they provided. Okay. Um, would you like to make a motion to approve? Motion to approve um, the Facilities Usage and Planning Subcommittee, um, minutes of September 25th. Second. Any further discussion or questions? Seeing none, all in favor? Okay, unanimous. All right, that brings us to section four, <coughs> report of the superintendents of schools, and we have some recognitions. Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. Thomas. Thank you. Um, first, I want to recognize a, a member in our audience. Um, our new director of the Adult Learning Center is with us, uh, Mustafa Mudini. I hope I said his name correctly. Mustafa, thank you for being here tonight. <laughs> Mustafa started um, last week in his new role, and we welcome him to the. He's been in Brockton for several years, um, and but he's with us now as the director of uh, the uh, Adult Learning Center. So. Mustafa, thank you for being here tonight, and congratulations. Next, I want to talk about um, two individuals. One is with us tonight. One could not make it um, for donations they made uh, and how much they care for the students of Brockton. Um, first, he could not be with us tonight is Mr. Mitch Hercule. 
um, of Ruby Hercule Memorial Foundation in Herc 42 Skills. He donated 12 pairs of brand new Puma basketball sneakers and two dozen Amazon Fire tablets to students that are in need. Um, students and their families were very grateful. So we want to thank Mr. Hercule, who couldn't be with us tonight. Um, he met me in the lobby uh, in my office at Central um, to present us with the, um, with the items. He donated the sneakers and the Amazon Fire tablets, and we were able to get those out um, to families in need. So we thank Mr. Hercule for his uh, very generous donation and for thinking of us. Next is an old friend, Nicole Gatlin, who is with the Teamsters Local 653, has been with First Student for a long time, also a, a parent of students in the Brockton Public Schools. And again, Nicole and I go way back, um, a great member of the community. Um, Nicole donated 60 backpacks on behalf of the Teamsters Local 653. She delivered 20 to the Angelo School and 40 others went to also students in needs. Uh, again, the students and family were very grateful. We really appreciate Nicole um, and the Teamsters for this uh, great donation. So we have a, um, a certificate of recognition for Nicole. So if you want to come on up, Nicole, and get your certificate, and we really thank you uh, for this donation. So next, uh, we want to welcome back uh, Dr. Richard Herman, the pandemic consultant who works with the mayor and the Board of Health uh, for a COVID-19 metrics update. We want to thank Ms. Uh, Dr. Herman for the presentations he's given us in the past. As you know, um, the school committee voted policy um, back on September 15th to start looking at the metrics in a, um, week by week. Um, that started on the first day of school, which was Wednesday, September 16th. We said we'd look, obviously, we would need to be yellow for three weeks before we would consider um, voting to bring students back to school, starting obviously with our uh, students with special needs and also uh, other students in high risk categories. Uh, tomorrow, um, October 7th, is, um, is the three week period, and as promised, um, and we really appreciate the doctor coming to give us an update on uh, current metrics and um, maybe a little insight of what, um, what the city numbers will look like tomorrow, um, which is the Wednesday of our third week. So, doctor, thank you for being here. Well, thank you for uh, inviting me back. Uh, I will uh, do my best to give you the most accurate and up-to-date numbers that I have, and we'll be happy to uh, answer any questions that you have as well about what's going on in uh, Brockton right now. Um, before starting, I just want to acknowledge my compatriot health care workers in the city at Good Samaritan Medical Center, at Brockton Hospital, and at the Neighborhood Health Center. Uh, it's, you know, they really are uh, on the front lines of taking care of folks. COVID is still out there, and uh, they're uh, really doing a, a great job uh, at all three health care facilities. And I think we're all fortunate to have them. So this is just an overview of <clears throat> where we stand nationally. This is uh, this afternoon's numbers from the CDC. Uh, we're kind of leveled off at about 40,000 cases a day. It's not at all where we thought we would be. We thought we would be plummeting uh, by now and then maybe seeing an uptick later in the fall. But we seem to have uh, leveled off a bit. Uh, and this is what the CDC thinks is going on in Massachusetts. So I've tried to adapt this a little bit to the numbers that we use in Massachusetts, specifically the Department of Education's uh, uh, data looking at uh, eight cases, 
per day per 100,000 and four cases per day per 100,000. This is since the beginning of the pandemic and uh, looking at exactly that, number of cases per day per 100,000 population in the Commonwealth. Now there's a little bit different than what the state uses. The state uses a 14 day rolling average. So they flatten out the ups and downs of the curve a little bit. <coughs> CDC uses a seven day rolling average. So it's a little bit more current. And you can see that in the state of Massachusetts over this last week, things are not going in the right direction. They are creeping up. And in fact, over to the right there, you can see uh, where they've been on each day. And they measured days since the beginning of the pandemic. So last Saturday, which is kind of the end of the two week period that we're gonna be looking at tomorrow. So tomorrow's number is gonna come out and it's gonna look at a 14 day period that ended last Saturday. That's day 211 up there. And so uh, the seven day rolling average uh, from Saturday was th they list as uh, 8.2. I'm not sure what the 14 day rolling average would be based on the CDC's account. But the CDC and the state numbers are gonna be a little different. Our numbers are gonna be far more accurate because that's just the numbers they had as of that day. They don't change them, they stay constant. In Massachusetts, if another case comes in today that we can attribute to last Tuesday, they'll update the numbers constantly, which is why it's a, a, a tough number to come up with ahead of time. You have to wait until it's published. Uh, so this is where we are uh, just in the city of Brockton. So drilling down a little bit more. That 4713 is where we were last time I was here. So just to give you the idea of uh, 170 or so uh, cases since uh, uh, the last time I was here. And uh, the death toll is now up to 290 in the city of Brockton. Uh, over this two week period that is gonna be announced tomorrow, uh, if I push the button today, and run the report, which I did at about 3.30 this afternoon, or asked the Board of Health to do it, asking for the total number of confirmed cases from the interim period, September 20th to October 3rd, which is the number that's gonna be published, there are 120 cases. Uh, of those 120 cases, 10 were in kids. Uh, nine of those 10 were school-aged kids, so ages five to 16 in that group. So nine would be falling into the, in the school age uh, range. No deaths, no hospitalizations. <clears throat> and this is the Commonwealth. This isn't Brockton, this is Massachusetts. This is that same two week period, what the age breakdown is by decade of life. And you can see again, as it has been really for the past many months, really skewed towards a younger population so that uh, the average age of a COVID patient, which is very similar to Brockton, by the way, almost identical, parallel in uh, Brockton, is 37 uh, with uh, the uh, younger kids and 20 year olds, 30 year olds making up a huge bulk of the new cases of COVID. This is tonight's dashboard that I put up at about five o'clock uh, this afternoon. So uh, 13 new cases today, and this seems to be a trend over the last week that we're seeing double digit number of cases per day, no new deaths. Active cases is 162, and just to put it into perspective, a week ago we were under 100. So we are seeing a rise. And there's been some buzz and concern on many fronts. Uh, Brockton Neighborhood Health Center, uh, for example, Two weeks ago, their testing positive rate was in the threes, three point something percent. Last week was over 10%, nearly tripled uh, from what it was. And uh, they are concerned as that is the largest uh, increase they've seen in quite, some, in quite some time. Hospitals are concerned because they're seeing some uh, additional uh, cases as well. And obviously we're concerned because the numbers are going up. This is the first time that I've actually written a note uh, usually I provide some graph with uh, some information, but I'm a little uh, concerned that we need to have a heightened level of awareness in the coming days, maybe weeks, uh, because the uh, numbers of cases per day have definitely increased recently. So where are we? <clears throat> so this is uh, recently the number of cases per day, just to see uh, where we've been. 
uh, including the 13 cases that are posted today. Uh, this, is, this is where we were last period when we were looking at the uh, uh, time frame between September uh, 13th and September 26th, and that's what's up on the dashboard now, uh, 6.0. But if, if we advance that a week and now look at our next time period, which is between September 20th and October 3rd, you can see these last four or five days of that time period kind of were up over the eight cases per day. And so if you actually do the math right now, if this were going to be posted based on the numbers as of 3.30 this afternoon, tomorrow's number will be 8.7. And this has changed even since last night when I presented to uh, City Council when uh, the calculation at that point was 8.2. And it's likely that the number tends to go up a little bit as new cases roll in and they get a new positive case come, come back today that was taken last Saturday, that kind of thing. So 8.7 is the best calculation that we have. And the way it's done is by asking the, the Commonwealth to tell me all the cases, confirmed cases, test date, September 20th to October 3rd. And quite honestly, this doesn't even get everybody uh, because it only includes the confirmed cases, not the probable cases. So this is a molecular test, a PCR test. It does not include people that have had antigen tests or antibody tests, which would make them likely to have had COVID. Uh, but this is just the confirmed uh, test during that interval of time. <laughs> but that's not all, okay? So looking forward, a week from tomorrow, what's the number going to be? Well, we don't know because that's going to be looking at the cases that end this coming Saturday. But hey, we're 10 days out of 14 already into this coming Saturday. So based on those 10 days that have already existed, and I don't know what the numbers are going to be over the next four days, but if it's a trend and they're going up like air going, uh, there's no reason to think that they're not going to change, but for right now, anyway, that number is looking to be 10.3. Now, I know this is a huge jump and a huge change, and these numbers are, I can, I can guarantee you, it won't be that number. It will be something different, but based on the math right now, that's where we are. So this is what the timeline looks like. Uh, these are the weekly posted DESC numbers over the last couple of months uh, from the time that they started publishing them, which I think was the 812 number of 7.0, and going back a few weeks just doing the math to figure out what it would have been if they had posted those numbers. And you can see where we're in a green area uh, a while ago in the middle of July, uh, and have since kind of hovered, as I said in the past, kind of in that six to eight uh, range. and. Uh, that's where we are now. I'm not optimistic that we're going to be going down next week. I'm more pragmatic that I think the number is going to be going up from 6.0 next week. So just to put it in perspective, this is where we are in Brockton. We're surrounded as of last period by a lot of yellow, green, zero communities, except for I think that's Avon in the red. Uh, and. Uh, I don't know what it's going to look like in the uh, tomorrow's map. Uh, I anticipate that there might be more communities turning green to yellow or yellow to red only because it looks like the CDC thinks that that statewide number is going up fairly rapidly. But this is what the uh, COVID map looks like in Massachusetts overall, not current, overall. From the beginning, there are six communities that are in the deep blue, which is the highest number of cases per population. So they say deep blue here is more than 350 cases per 10,000. That's more than 3.5% of the residents uh, have COVID. So for us, it's about 5%. We're really 4.9 something percent of the people that live in Brockton have had a COVID diagnosis. So of those six communities, as of last week. That's what they look like. And uh, this was where they were last night. Five out of the six were in the red. Only one was in 
uh, the yellow, which was us. And so what do we have in common uh, with those other communities? Well, just about everything. Uh, so these are communities that are challenged by all kinds of things that make COVID thrive. Uh, and COVID has uh, been shown uh, to be more prevalent in people of color, Frontline workers, Brockton ranks number one, according to the Donahue Institute at, UM at UMass, number one in terms of percentage of frontline workers uh, in, the, in the city. And as you know, frontline workers are more exposed to uh, COVID. Overcrowding, household size, people together. Uh, so you can see that all the communities are kind of up there near the top 10 in terms of these rankings. So this is over time, again, looking at the case rate per day, per 100,000, going back to when I started tracking, which was in mid-May, when the cases were somewhere up in the stratosphere. And over the last several months, as I've showed you in the past, have kind of hovered in that six to eight range, but now, recently are starting to kind of poke their head above that eight range, just doing the, just doing the math. I don't know which way things are gonna go, but if they go like most pandemics, unless you do something to stop it, it goes up. And so uh, there's nothing that we're doing out of the ordinary to stop it. I think that the curfew that was in place in our city probably kept us in the yellow more than in those other cities that were in the red and didn't have a curfew. But I think that if that number is, as I suspect, going up, uh, I think we're going to have to all put our heads together and figure out what new actions uh, need to be taken in order to drive it down. Because as I've said in the past, to safely open the schools, you need to have low amount of COVID in the community. And we know that especially in the higher grades, middle school and high school, COVID is likely to spread a little faster than it is in the uh, you know, 10 year old and under age group. So a different perspective though, I know that this is kind of where we were and where we are, but just to kind of keep these into perspective and it's not a pleasant perspective, but COVID is gonna be here for a while. I mean, it's true we are gonna get a treatment, you know, the monoclonal antibody treatment uh, that is uh, uh, a couple of companies are making will be available, I don't know, within weeks or months, but hopefully by the end of the year for sure, uh, so that at least uh, COVID doesn't become a death sentence, it becomes a treatable illness. Uh, sometime after that, maybe we'll have some home testing kits so that you can wake up in the morning and brush your teeth, take a shower, do your COVID test, decide if you're gonna go to work or not, go to school or not, because you'll have a, a test that costs a buck uh, that you can run and get a blue line and decide I have it or I don't have it. Uh, and then there'll be a vaccine and the vaccine is gonna come whenever it comes, you know, maybe it'll be in the next couple months, maybe it'll be in the early part of next year, but once it comes, then people have gotta get it. Maybe they'll have to get it twice and then it'll have to take over in the population until we get some immunity in the population. So that's next year sometime. So the planning that we think uh, that we're going to have here is a long-term plan in terms of where we're going to go with this. And that's all I got. And I'm happy to answer uh, any questions. Do any of the committee members have any questions for Dr. Herman? Ms. Azak. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, as always, you try to provide as much information um, that you have uh, to always keep us informed. So in the cases that, as far as Brockton, um, do we have that broken down, like how age brackets, things like that? Is it because kids went back to school? Why did it just jump like that? when we were doing fine, um, do we, you know, I know the whole HIPAA thing, I'm not asking for specific names or anything, but is it school-aged children? Why did we, why did it jump like that? Other than going back to school, that's all I can think of that's happened within the past three weeks. Um, well, uh, don't forget, it hasn't jumped really dramatically in school-aged children. That, those 10 
kids that I show you were out of 120. So it's really less than 10 percent of all the of all the kids of all the cases are still in school age children. There were a bunch in the 20s, and I didn't break it down, and I probably should have. There were a bunch in the 20s and 30s. The average age was in the high 30s, I think 38 or 39 in Brockton, just for that two week period. But since basically since uh, phase three reopening on July 6th, the pattern has been pretty constant, which is the 20s and 30 year olds are kind of at the peak of the curve. The uh, school-aged children are much higher than they used to be. You remember at the beginning of the pandemic, 5% was school-aged children. Now it's, you know, it had been closer to around 15%. So that's, you know, just since kids were not locked up anymore, you know, we're all out and about over the summer, I think the, the number got uh, a, a little higher. But it's remained pretty constant. But we're full remote. So what is it going to be if we go back? Um, well, hybrid. if you just look at that two-week period, you know, you got nine kids in two-week period, so 10 school days, you know, nine kids, a kid a day, a case a day. case a day that can shut down one school. Well, you know, you have to, make the, you have to decide what the plan is going to be. So a case a day might be scary to some. It might be, okay, you know, how are we going to deal with the case? Where is the case located? If a case is in a classroom, are you going to shut down the whole school? Or are you just going to figure out who the close contacts were of that, children, and of that child? And you've you got to come up with the plan. And that's why, you know, the last few times I'm, I've been here, my, my hope is that you have a plan and that you're able to test the plan and so that when a case arises, it's not, oh, my goodness, there's a panic, there's a case. The kid's probably going to be fine. Statistically, the kid is going to be fine, okay? It's how are we going to stop the spread? How are we going to identify the contacts so that to contain it so it becomes an isolated case as opposed to a cluster of cases? But that's what, the, that's what your numbers are right now in the city of Brockton. So has the testing, have the testing numbers gone up? Because I'm finding that people are getting out there and actually getting tested um, a little more often than they were before. Uh, a lot of times, I mean, I'm seeing it on social media. I'm seeing it personally. People are like, okay, you know what? We just got tested to be safe. So maybe that factored in that people are actually going to the testing sites nowadays um, and, and taking it, you know, seriously to the point where let's get tested. We have some of the symptoms. Let's get tested. Um, so have, have the numbers at the testing sites gone up? So the numbers have gone up from, uh, I'd say, early summer. When we initiated the Stop the Spread campaign uh, about a, two months ago, a month and a half ago or so, uh, the numbers dramatically went up. And when I say that, uh, we were kind of maybe 800 tests a week, and they went up to maybe 1,600 tests a week at their max. And now they're in the low 1,000s, but it's been pretty steady for the last month, the low 1,000s, uh, so you know, 1,100, 1,200 cases a week. It's hard to put it in perspective because, quite honestly, I don't know what the right amount should be. I don't know if anyone knows what the right amount should be. Should, you know, that's 1% of your population uh, of the city getting tested each week. Is that good or should we have 10% of the population being tested each week? I don't know. It seems like that's a, you know, it's pretty typical when the Stop the Spread initiated. I think that the target was to get 1% of the population tested each week. And so we've achieved that and maintained that over uh, at least the last four or five weeks, maybe more. One of the questions I, um, I had is, uh, Dr. Fauci has, I think they said that anywhere from three days to 5.2 days, it takes the virus. So there's a lot of false um, results because people, I think, are going too soon before it actually shows in their body. Um, I mean, is that, I, I heard that on, on the news and I'm like, you know, maybe some people are just going too soon. Um, what information would you have on something like that? I mean, is that something that is true? So I actually have the timeline. Can I reboot that slide? I don't know if it, um, oh, there you go, right there. Uh, so there's the answer to your question. This is uh, just the science behind it all. So, uh, and if you wanna look at it, I don't know, I thought it might be a little bit too much science and a little too boring, but if you look at uh, the timeline above there, sort of day zero, day zero is the day of your symptom, 
onset, okay? So when you were sick, okay? I first got my fever, I first got my cough, I first felt sick, okay? You are contagious up to 48 hours before that. So in your pre-symptomatic phase, that is when you are contagious. You might have been exposed, that, that symptom that says day zero there, probably it happens between two and 14 days after your exposure. The average is about five days five to six days, and that's probably what Dr. Fauci was saying when he said 5.2, but sort of in that five to six day range. So you get exposed, I get exposed to you right now, five days from now is when I'm gonna start coughing and, and get my fever. But two days before that, I will have been contagious and infective, so I could have given it to someone else and I would test positive in those two days. The three days before I got sick, or the four days, I might not test positive because there's not enough viral load yet. There's not enough RNA to, to, to make the test positive yet. So yes, you can test a little bit too early, um, but, but this is why it's a, a struggle for contact tracers because when someone tests positive, you know, they gotta go to you and say, okay, you're positive. When was your first symptom? Okay, my first symptom. I, I got my test result today, it's Tuesday. When did you have the test? I had it done on Sunday and it took two days to get it back. When did you get sick? Friday, okay. So think back two days before Friday and anybody that you were within six feet for more than 15 minutes. This is a challenge, because who the heck remembers where they were you know, last Wednesday night and how long they were with somebody? And now, how many people have you infected you know, in that interim, which is why, you know, getting a rapid test turnaround, getting your test done as soon as you have symptoms, why all these things are so important. And then your test, so usually, so after your first day of symptoms, you can infect someone else, usually up to 10 days after you first develop symptoms. So very highly infectious in that first five days. After that, it falls off dramatically. But that's why we say someone who's infected has to isolate for 10 days. And after the 10 days, usually, and probably day six through 10, not quite as contagious, but, but after day 10, not gonna be contagious because your viral load has plummeted if your body has won the race against the, against the virus. You can still have a positive test though, weeks later, because there's some RNA still hanging around. But just because you have RNA hanging around, doesn't mean that you have a virus that's capable of infecting someone. So even though a test may be positive three weeks from now, four weeks from now, uh, uh, that doesn't mean that you still have COVID-19. It means you've got traces of the genetic material hanging around in your body. Have I answered the question? No, you did actually, thank you. Um, I, I heard it quickly the other day and I, I never realized it took that long um, between, well, they said between the three point Three point uh, three to five point two days. So this explanation is yeah. very thorough. So yeah. thank you. And the, and the two to fourteen days is that, that you can start developing your symptoms any time between two and fourteen days after your uh, exposure. Which is why, if if you have an exposure to someone with known COVID nineteen, you are in quarantine for fourteen days because you can start developing your symptoms any time. Even if you test negative on day two or four or six or eight or 12, you still need to be in quarantine. It is not your get out of jail free card because you have a negative test. So anyone who's been exposed to someone who's known COVID-19 positive, they're out for 14 days. And my last question is, um, I, I know there was one strain that you didn't have to have a temperature if you had the virus, um, that if you weren't registering a temperature. Have you seen any new strains that we're not familiar with? So uh, it's, yeah. So uh, they don't type the strains, okay? So I wouldn't know what strain you have. That's a pretty extensive virology test to kind of look at the molecular makeup of a strain. But not everybody gets every symptom, and certainly not everybody gets a fever. <clears throat> I would say far, well, I don't, I, we can probably actually look and see what the Department of Public Health, because they do ask the symptoms, but it's not consistent in terms of who they ask the symptoms. But fever is not necessarily the presenting symptom in a lot of people with COVID. Many, many, many people do not have fever. 
<coughs> and I would probably put it in the 50% range. Okay, no, so, thank you. Which is why, you know, the forehead temperatures that we've all been through in certain, uh, you know, circumstances uh, are not gonna detect who has COVID. They're gonna detect who has a fever that day, but, you know, may or may not have anything to do with COVID. No, thank you for clarifying that, because sometimes people think, oh, I don't have a temperature. It doesn't mean that you don't have the virus. So, um, but no, thank you so much for all the information this evening. Sure. Yeah, as, as a always. matter of fact, you can have a fever or you can have no fever. You can have a cough, you can have no cough. You can have symptoms, you can have no symptoms. That's why it's so difficult to make the diagnosis. You can be totally asymptomatic, zero symptoms, still test positive and be contagious. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Dr. Rath, thank you for coming as usual. Um, with respect to uh, children between the ages, of our school age children, uh, preschool through high school, let's just say between four and 18 or 19, um, what, what is the main symptomology when, when these students do come down with COVID and, 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 and they are exhibiting some sort of a reaction, so to speak? Pretty similar uh, to adults in terms of cough, fever, respiratory symptoms, runny nose, mainly though a lot of fatigue and loss of energy and also a little bit more likely than adults to have some GI stuff like nausea and vomiting. Okay. So it looks like any other sick kid with the respiratory grunge. There's no way that you can tell it apart from a cold or a flu. Well, you, know, you can do the testing obviously, but there's so much overlap, which is why this, you know, this coming flu season scares me just because there's gonna be so much overlap between flu and COVID uh, that it really, you know, you can drill down about on how long the symptoms lasted and how quickly they started and that kind of thing. But at the end of the day, people are gonna to have to be presumed to have both or either tested for both. I think it's gonna be a, a big challenge for physicians and you know that that challenge is is yet to come i am hoping that people follow the rules because the same rules that will protect you from covid will protect you from the flu and it's interesting because i have given lectures on uh, influenza and, and when whenever giving a lecture we kind of always talk about hand washing uh, but had never really said mask wearing and social distancing but clearly the same thing this is a respiratory virus droplets you know, same kind of transmission. And so the things that will protect you from COVID will protect you from the flu. And I have this optimistic outlook that everyone is gonna be taking care of themselves during this coming season, get a flu shot, hand washing, wearing masks, staring clear of anybody that's got uh, sniffles and that will have the, you know, the, the, the most mild flu season ever just because uh, folks are gonna be uh, taking care of themselves doing this kind of thing. And in, in that age bracket, um, right now, you, the, the slides show that there are no hospitalizations and no deaths in that category. Just in that two-week period. Right. Yeah. Um, um, in, in the age bracket, let's say from 20 to 65 or 70, uh, in Brockton, how many hospitalizations are there right now in that, in that right, population? Right now? Present. Like current? Well, currently, uh, there's, I think, 13 people in the hospital. I don't know the ages of the people that are in the hospital right now. So that 13 in Brockton, Brocktonians in the hospital being treated for this. And, and, what, and what is their symptoms? What is happening in terms of their uh, reaction? Why do they need to be in the hospital? Well, I can't tell you what those people specifically, but I can tell you that people get admitted to the hospital, you know, in general, because they can't be cared for at home. So... Uh, somebody's too sick, too weak, too dehydrated, oxygen level is too low and needs supplemental oxygen, seriously ill, needs to be in an intensive care unit, needs IV treatment of some kind, whether it's remdesivir or IV antibiotics, something that has to be given IV. Those are the reasons for coming into the hospital. But it's in general, it, you know, it's a level of illness that's more severe. Usually, 
I, will, I don't want to say universally, but usually these are people with other illnesses as well, other comorbid conditions as well. So it's usually COVID plus mm -hmm. COPD, diabetes, heart disease, that kind of thing. When was the last death in Brockton? Last death? Yeah. Because of COVID. Around September 30th. Late September, last death. The last time there were two deaths on that day. I don't remember the exact date, but around that date. Do you remember the age bracket of the roughly of the what people age? that died? Yeah. So the last two deaths, one was um, 80 ish something and one was 50 ish something. 50 ish. Mm. Um, anyone else with questions? Sir. Oh. oh, I'm sorry, Tony. Uh, Mr. Rodriguez. Thank you, Doc. Um, seeing all these graphs, is the Board of Health identifying um, certain areas in the city that's affected more than the others? Because I would like to know, like, you know, is this side of town more affected than the other side? Is the center of town yeah. more affected than the other? So that very first graph I had up was every COVID case, okay? by address, you get a dot. So we know where they are. And in general, it tends to correlate with the population center of the city. So right down the central corridor is where most of the COVID happened with the exception of a couple of bright spots on the east side and the west side that correlate to the nursing homes, which is where we've had some significant outbreaks. But uh, it really is correlating just with the population centers of the city. Now, what we're doing is, is we've, we've actually now sort of to peel back the layers of the onion a little bit and do a little bit deeper dive in terms of trying to figure out how this thing is spreading. Uh, just because clearly we are challenged like all those other high volume cities. It's just hard to control a pandemic. In the history of man versus pandemic, we know who the winner is 100% of the time. I mean, it's not an outbreak, it's not an epidemic, it already won, it's a pandemic, it's, it's got us. Uh, and so what we're trying to do is figure out how is it spreading in Brockton? And we've, uh, with the help of the state, we now have this kind of CSI Brockton. It's the, uh, it's the Epidemiologic uh, Investigation Unit. Uh, so, I don't know, EIU, something like that that the uh, CTC, the uh, Community Tracing Collaborative, uh, which is the arm of partners in health that the Mass Department of Public Health is using to do the contact tracing, well, they now are kind of helping areas where there's a high amount of COVID to kind of look and identify, are these cases coming from work? Are they coming from home? Are there outbreaks? If there are outbreaks, uh, how are they spreading? Because this is a crazy thing when, when uh, you know, as our Board of Health in Brockton knows the cases that are in Brockton, they don't know what's in Randolph and Easton unless Randolph and Easton shares that with us. And so there may be a case in Brockton, and I, you know, presented this in, in the past where you've got uh, uh, a, uh, a, a, a situation in Brockton where there's a house of worship that has... Uh, uh, 60 people at a, a service followed by a dinner uh, and one person is infected and one and before you know it you got 20 or 25 cases we don't even hear about it for weeks and weeks later why because nobody in that church in the city of Brockton actually lived in Brockton they were all invited by an outside organization that held this event and so it takes sometimes it's it's not quite so easy to identify these cases because you have to wait for town number one to talk to town number three, talk to town number two, and, and then bring it all together. And that's what this investigation unit is helping us do. And so now we have a weekly call with them to try and identify workplaces, are these house parties, are these family spreads, healthcare workers, certain professions, and look a little bit uh, deeper. It's not as easy as it sounds, especially since the information flows very, very slowly. And some people don't want to share their information. Uh, it's not 100% of people that are cooperative. As a matter of fact, 
it's way, way less than that. Un uh, I mean, very discouragingly low, less than that. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I agree with you. It's very discouraging as well when, uh, you know, our board of health department doesn't share that information with the school department as well. Um, I've kind of been hammering at it for a while now um, with the equity task force. Um, I feel that it's important that they do share that information um, through our health department, through Linda Cahill, so they can identify these addresses that do have active cases so the school department can identify if we have any students that actually reside in those addresses. We're not asking for any names, how old they are, male or female. We just want to know if we have students that, that actually live in these residents because that's going to be based on how I vote to uh, reopen this school or even bring the students back at any capacity. So you as a doctor, do you feel that is, that's an important aspect of the Board of Health to actually share that information with the school department? Well, I think globally it is important. I, I quite honestly, I'm sure there are restrictions on the kind of information that the Board of Health can share publicly or even with the school department. I don't know exactly the rules behind that, but I do know that even with these clusters that uh, come out um, when the um, uh, epidemiologic investigation unit presents it to us, a lot of it is de-identified. We don't know names. We don't even know the names necessarily of the business. When, when I'm learning it, I don't know the name of the building, the I mean the name of the business, the name of the church, uh, that kind of thing. The Board of Health does, of course, because they have to do the, the contact tracing. But any uh, sharing of information uh, I think is, is limited and restricted just based on what their confidentiality rules are. And I'm, I'm not really, really familiar with what those, you know, the, the, the details of those rules and who can uh, get that information. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? As usual, doctor, thank you for your detailed report. Uh, once again, I will tell you, you are a favorite with the people at home. Yeah. They tune in because of you. So we appreciate everything that you do and certainly the, the information you provide to the community. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. You. Herman. We appreciate it. I'll see you again. Next item, Mr. Superintendent. Yeah, so I just think um, obviously we need to see the numbers tomorrow. Um, then I think we should have a policy meeting uh, next week, which we can bring up under um, items to refer so we can discuss this further. And um, we did have a discussion with the mayor about getting clusters, uh, neighborhoods um, that could be re reported to the superintendent when we have to make decisions about school, not only bringing school back, but also if we have to cl close a school down because we know a certain neighborhood uh, has a lot of cases and those students go to a particular school. So I uh, have worked with the mayor on that. So we'll have to talk further about that in a policy subcommittee. But, um, you know, that's point well taking that. Um, but I don't think that um, they will, I don't think that they would object to knowing areas as long as, like you said, it doesn't identify people um, where it wouldn't violate the law. So but it does make a decision, help make a decision on policy makers and people that make decisions about the safety of the entire school department. So that's a discussion point we have to, we have to talk about. And also, um, you know, the doctor said about having a plan when this case is in a school, we do have a clear plan in the reopening committee. I'll bring that. Uh, the reopening committee came up with plans. We use the Department of Education's guidelines about if there are cases in schools and what we have to do. Um, they updated those guidelines on September 14th, which I don't agree with. Um, I would use the, the July 15th guidelines, which basically if there's a, there's a, a case, simple case, if, you know, just a simple example, if there's a case in a classroom, um, the new guidelines say you would, you would just notify the um, students or staff that were in six feet of the individual um, for up to 15 minutes or beyond 15 minutes. The guidelines on that chain, that's the new guidelines on September 14th. The guidelines on July, it was July 14th or 15th said that everybody in that cohort would be notified. 
So a cohort for half of a class is about 10 to 12, and then you have obviously the staff. It could be a teacher, a para, or an MTA. And again, we can talk about this in our policy, but my suggestion would be you notify everybody in that classroom. Um, some school districts have gone with the new guidelines, which again, I do not agree with. I think it should be the, the earlier guidelines, which is everybody in that cohort gets notified that they were a close contact, because I think you can't really determine over six and a half hours of students being in school whether how many of the 12 students were actually in close contact with that that student for you know up to 15 minutes i just think you err on the side of caution and everybody in the cohort gets notified and that's again we can talk more about that at next week's meeting but obviously we'll have our updated um, numbers tomorrow and we'll have to talk about the decision we make as we you know as we bring back students if it's safe to do so we would obviously start with our students with special needs yeah I mean I, I certainly would agree with that I've, I've had a conversation with some of the um, a couple of parents who do have special needs children and they are finding it very um, problematic to keep their children engaged remotely and to really um, feel that they're getting a, a uh, an, an education or really a benefit and even and I've even had that conversation today I got a call from a gentleman who has a kindergarten uh, student and you know, he says that she's just you know a handful to try to keep you know on a computer screen engaged and I can imagine he is voicing probably a lot of feelings that many of our other parents of the little ones who's certainly, you know, attention span on a computer screen is not going to be ideal or optimal. Um, so, you know, he's concerned with, you know, the building blocks of education, you know. Is this child going to receive what she needs in kindergarten and then to, you know, move on to first grade and second grade? And, and that's, that's one of the concerns I had when we were pointing this out. I mean, I, I understand... You know, safety is job one. I totally agree with that. But we all need to, I think, recognize that what are we going to have in terms of a generation of students here, this cohort of students in these certain years. How prepared are they moving on? You know, this is something, this is not just a Brockton problem. I mean, yep. this, is, this, is, this, is a, this is a, 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 a nationwide, certainly for our country, uh, that we have to pay attention to. Um, so, I mean, what we shall see, I mean, you know, the question, uh, uh, you know, the dirty question is going to be, do you really graduate these kids? If, if we're going to have a whole year of this type of, do we move these kids on? I, 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 I don't have that answer, but it's something that we, people need to, in, in positions of uh, knowledge, need to think about, you know, and so, so these are the, uh, these are the pitfalls, but you know, again, like you said, our special needs kids, the kids that are where th this type of learning is just not effective yeah. for them, you know, I mean, that, that's, the, that's, the, uh, that's the dilemma we all find yep. ourselves in. So. Absolutely, especially our youngest learners as well. Yeah, yeah. So next we want to um, talk about um, family support, our help desk, technology help desk, and then our uh, parents that came up with the great idea of the super users. Um, they've been running trainings um, for other parents. They'll continue to do so. Um, and with the help of community agencies like the NAACP Education Committee, Sabora, um, the Haitian um, Community Center, um, and the Cape Verdean Association helping us um, with our training in, um, of being trained in how to use our learning management system, how to use, um, how to help parents navigate the laptops that we use, uh, those trainings will continue. Um, there's another one coming up this Thursday night. I know Jess Hodges has spent a lot of time uh, with our super users, um, you know, getting them up to date with training. They did a training at Brockton High School a couple weeks ago, and they'll continue to support our families as well as obviously the support that happens every day from our school administrators and our teachers supporting uh, their students and the families, um, which has been amazing. Um, 
and has to continue, obviously, in this very tough situation of remote learning, um, but also to our help desk. So, Ethan, if you can jump in and give us an update on the, um, what our help desk is doing, and I, get, I believe Dr. Cobbs will be moving into the old Rockland Trust building pretty soon. Right. Yep, um, which will become a help desk center. Thank you, Ethan. All right. Um, good morning. Good morning. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I do want to underscore something the superintendent said, which is there are a lot of people who are joining forces to try and support everyone. You know, when you have 15,000, 16,000 users, it's really going to take more than one department. So uh, the parents, those super users are fantastic. We have. Um, really found that we have principals who uh, in their second or third act might want to work at Best Buy, maybe in the Geek Squad. They're, they're just a lot of people are getting together and really helping out. We do have a dedicated uh, help desk for instructional technology. So if you're having problems with Schoology or Zoom or um, you know logging on to Clever, that's uh, that's in my area. We have a uh, number, I will give it out. It's 508-580-7277. And I'm sure Jess will make sure that you see it. It's on the website. But we also have a um, very easy to type, let me assure you, email. It's instructional technology support, all one word, at bpsma.org and um, we do a pretty good job. There are only four of us monitoring that, but we do a pretty good job in the evening on weekends looking at that. So uh, we've been able to help a lot of uh, very frustrated families. It's, um, we, we fully understand it, we appreciate it, and that's one of the reasons why we are doing everything in our power to help people out and uh, to get them online, to swap out their computer if they need it, to put them in touch with the resources to get the uh, MiFi devices or the Comcast Internet Essential Services. So in addition to that, we have um, Dan Vigeon's crew, and they're the ones who, if there's something wrong with the actual device, they will help out if you don't know how to turn on the device. If when you turn on the device, it you know has a black screen and it just won't change from black, you know all those sorts of problems. That's the uh, technology, not instructional technology. Technology support, and Dr. Cobbs is going to have that uh, Northside Bank. Mike had a couple good lines about what you can do in the neighborhood: pick some chocolate, drive through, but. Um, any questions about that? I would just, like you said, point out you know, there are a lot of parents who are stepping up and who know quite a bit uh, with respect to computers and feel much more comfortable. And, and I think they are sharing that um, knowledge and reaching out and assisting other families. So that really is a a great a great thing you know something good comes out of something bad as they say you know and uh, um, so we, we certainly thank and encourage people to continue to help each other out um, you know, if, you, if you if you are savvy with computers uh, you know, please uh, you know offer your services and your help talk to your you know call the principal of your school and if you have time to help out or basically you know give a helping hand to some people that may not have a, a, a grasp of technology as well as you do um, and have time to volunteer, that would be a great, uh, a great resource. So I think your school principal would be the place to call to offer your services uh, for, each, for each school and maybe your school principal might delegate that, uh, that role to perhaps you know, um, an assistant or someone else. But uh, if, you, if you do have time to donate please 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 do uh you know you're not going to be at the school helping out on the recess uh <laughs> on the recess uh area or out, out in the park but um you could be very helpful beneficial online with people uh 
who need some assistance. So we thank you if you can do that. Ethan, if you can give us an update on attendance and engagement. Yep, and, and I forgot one very important group. We had a group of um, volunteers, basically, from the various departments. So uh, we had native speakers of uh, Haitian Creole, Cape Verdean Creole, the Associated French and Portuguese with that, and Spanish. And so those were in person. We did it at the Arnon School, a nice central location. Dr. Cobbs provided a tent. We had, uh, it was outdoors. He made sure that we had all the PPE, the wipes, the gloves, you name it, um, the hand sanitizer, and parents showed up. They were invited. These are probably the neediest of parents in terms of um, you know, the, the most basic sorts of questions, and they really you know, just struggled to get uh, through the phone support, and so you know, Mike has been very clear. We're in the people business. It's our job, basically, to provide good customer service. That's what we're aiming for. So this was a need. We had people within our department stepping up to do this. We trained some folks, and uh, it's, it's just fabulous to see. So attendance. Here are the numbers. I do have to tell you that um, these are not the firmest of firm numbers. There are a lot of reasons for that, but uh, generally speaking, the numbers appear to be very high. So I'm gonna go over attendance and I'm gonna go over what we're calling engagement and we're gauging that engagement through logons to Clever, that is our single sign-on. In terms of attendance, I'm at that age where I can barely see the paper, but then I can't see you if I take my glasses off. 94.1% of students were in attendance. If you look, this is on average from the start of the school year until uh, yesterday's attendance. So it's 94.1%. Uh, we had, in terms of engagement, we had um, a slightly lower number. Ethan, as compared to what in a normal school year without the it, pandemic. It's very close to normal, and that, that figure probably was lower than usual because it's including pre-K. I wanted to include pre-K and kindergarten, and those, those uh, numbers have been quite um, unusually low. The, the remote has really hurt those two, but there's so few pre-K students that it doesn't really affect the overall but it still was you know, noteworthy and it was unusual. So that's what the attendance figures are, but are those as accurate as when you're in person? And you know, if, if Ethan skips out of his third period class and takes off for the day, it's gonna be very different than if Ethan's at home and you know, checks out of his third period class. But as long as he's there in the beginning of the day, as long as he's there at the end of the day, is he showing up for attendance? So we haven't really, um, we're not as accurate, I would say. Um, how, do you judge, how do you judge if a kid is really engaged? You, there are ways to do it, but it's just capturing that at scale is what we're working on. We had, um, in terms of students on Monday, I thought this was an important, you know, I, I just, I picked a random day. They were all roughly the same, so it wasn't as if I'm, I'm cherry picking the best or the worst day. Roughly speaking, 16.7% uh, of all students in the Brockton Public Schools on Monday did not log in to Clever. So if you say roughly 17% did not log in, that meant that 83% um, did log in to Clever on Monday. Is it theoretically possible that there was good reason not to log in to Clever? Yes. Is it theoretically possible that you were still experiencing difficulties? Yes, especially this Monday. Um, we have been moving extremely quickly. We, uh, thanks to uh, our chief academic officer, June Saban McGuire, if you ever need uh, a contract, she will get it for you very quickly. We were able to finally get a contract with Zoom, and so we're upgrading, and that upgrade knocked a bunch of kids who had been able to get it in 
out and a lot of teachers out. So uh, that was Monday. So it is it is possible, although I, as I said, it's not those figures were not that unusual. But that does mean that there are 17 percent of the Brockton Public School students who were not logging into Clever for whatever reason. How does that square with the 94.1 percent? If you're trying to log in, but you can't and it's not your fault and you're on the phone with us and you're on the phone with the school, obviously we're not marking you as not attending. That's not your fault. So um, that's, that's the, uh, those are the numbers that we have. Any questions for Ethan? I had one. Mike? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Thank you, Ethan. I just have one question. That telephone number you gave in the yep. beginning, is that for the support, the family support? Yep. The help desk? Yep. And that's going to be at the Rockland Trust? I'm sorry? That that's going to be at the Rockland Trust? Oh, no. The number that I gave, <clears throat> that's central office, that's my department. So call that number if you have a question about how to use any of the instructional software, how to log into uh, Schoology, uh, how to log into Clever, you can't get into your Zoom meeting. Those are the sorts of questions we answer. So the hours would be regular school hours? No. 8.30? We don't sleep. It's crazy. Uh, I'm not joking about that. Just 24 hours a day? Not 24, but we, we, we stay up, 15, we answer. So. You know, it's, we, have, we have phones that we try and check the message, and we have email. Email is a lot better after hours. The new phone system is uh, is a challenge for us, but the email is is we, we try and get to that. These people can call, if they're having trouble right now can call. If they if they call, they're leaving a message, and it's hard for us right now to get into the that phone line. But if they send us an email right now, we probably are answering it. In fact, I did answer an email while I was sitting there. Wow. And then, uh, Mr. Sullivan, the number for the help desk where you need the actual support for the device uh, um, is 508-468-0973. Again, the BPS help desk phone number is 508-468-0973, and that will be the number that will be moved over to um, the former Rockland Trust building, what will become our hub for our help desk. And again, those, those hours will be into the night as well to support families, especially working parents um, that need to assist children when they get home from work. So it's important that they have, they can place calls as well um, outside of the normal school hours. So um, that will be set up, I believe, starting next week. Um, even though the help desk is set up, I mean, that's all set up now, it's running out of central, but um, it will be able to, it will be over at the, um, the former Rockland Trust, and that's where um, people will be able to go swap out their, their device as well. They've been doing that at the schools, and then it will transfer over to, um, to that location, and that's where the help desk would be. So thank to, thanks to Dr. Dr. Cobbs and the facilities department for getting that ready, um, and also Dan Vigian and, and everyone. So, and I also want to, again, um, we understand that this is not easy. Um, this is not the way we want to educate kids. We know that uh, even though I th uh, teachers have done a tremendous job with our administrators reaching out to families, making calls, um, like Mr. Minichello said, keeping a pre-K or kindergarten student or even um, a lot of students um, engaged in front of a computer isn't the way we want to educate students. Um, I, I have two middle schoolers who, you know, they're a pain to keep in front of the computer and, and for six hours. But again, we are mandated by the state to, um, to provide you know, a full learning day. Um, and that brings me to my next uh, point about pre-K and kindergarten. Um, those hours we can be flexible with. Um, they don't fall under time and learning. We have heard the complaints from parents for those young children. We've heard the teachers' feedback as well about the length of a day for a pre-K or in a kindergarten student. So um, we've heard that. Jess is sending out a survey, survey to our pre-K and kindergarten parents. She's also sending a survey out pre-K to 12. That's going out this week to get parents feedback on how things are going. Um, but we do really want to take a look at the remote kindergarten and pre-K full 
day schedule and scale that back because it is too long obviously for um, for those young children to be online I mean it's just six hours in front of a computer for a pre-k and a, a kindergarten student so we want adjust, we want to look into adjusting that uh, but we want to send a survey out to parents and then have this discussion next week at a curriculum subcommittee meeting we can have a proposal of a schedule we think that would work um, and also as far as so we're in the 15th day of um, something we've never done before full remote learning um, and we also have to and we've been discussing with our teachers um, and they have been making adjustments again everybody's new to this but they're building in more break time um, for students so they're getting away from the computer and this is for all students um, given the more in independent work to do um, and that's got to be put in um, as well uh, again we have to show a full day especially in grades 1 through 12 that is what we are expected to do from the Department of Education is a full learning day but we are able to count independent work towards that so teachers will be being creative getting now that they we've been in school 15 days um, getting to know their students virtually um, but we'll start to gauge that and, and provide more breaks um, during classes um, you know to, again to get students away from the computer because we have heard the parents we understand how hard this is that people are working um, students are not in school and we know that people are frustrated um, but again we're going to work do our best to make sure that there are breaks throughout the day and again as we continue to watch our numbers and we know how important it is to bring students back to school um, because the, that's the way students should be learning and we know how hard this is the hardest and I've said this to the teachers and the staff this is the hardest they'll ever have to work nobody ever went to school to teach this way no one ever wanted to teach this way um, and they have done a great job of uh, transitioning to not only this new world of remote learning but also a new learning management system navigating issues with zoom and I know that's been frustrating but we have upgraded our zoom account using teams as well um, Microsoft 365 you know and some people say why don't you get away from 365 and, or just use 365 and don't use zoom you really have to have two platforms because if zoom crashes then you got to be able to go to 365 if 365 crashes you got to have zoom as a backup they're all going to have issues because I think last week some of you I think um, Ms. Azak 365 went down in your office and it was down at thank God it was night but everything was down last I forget what night last week 365 was down so if that was during the day we would have zoom to switch over to um, but again we're going to have those issues because everybody in the country is using zoom or, or teams um, and you know we'll continue to work through it and support our parents and also we need to you know, let people understand like and this could happen into Thursday um, there's another windstorm coming um, in on Wednesday afternoon into Thursday and if that if power goes down we will obviously waive absences we always do things in the benefit of kids um, and we'll continue to do that uh, we'll get notices out so parents understand that if they can if their child can't log on because of loss of power or internet access or our teachers don't have power in some of our schools um, we'll make sure it's clear to people uh, like last week that you know that absence is not going to be counted against them and again we'll continue to work and, and thankfully power was restored to most homes but other, but there was about 400 homes that stayed out late until the afternoon into the early evening and obviously we're not going to hold that absence against a student that can't log on um, so those are the things again we're working through but again I really appreciate how the patience of our parents we know how difficult it is and that's why we take you know this decision about returning to school serious because we know how important it is for our students to be back especially our high risk in students with disabilities and our youngest learners but it's every student um, you know the going to school is the best years of your life and you know we understand how how hard this is so so that's our, um, when we go to the report to um, items to report um, refer to a subcommittee we'll talk about a curriculum subcommittee to review the pre-k and the kindergarten schedules um, quickly for FY 21 budget update Aldo could not be with us tonight um, 
as you know, the, gov the, the governor um, fund and the state funded us for the first three months so far to the end of November. That was level funding from FY20. Um, we anticipate that that will stay um, throughout the year, that they will keep their commitment and level fund us through the rest of um, FY21. Um, along with the CARES Act money and the ESSER funds that came in, uh, we should be able to get through the rest of this year um, you know, without any major issues or, or cut any more cuts. Um, and we're hoping somehow, holding out hope that they might give us some Student Opportunity Act money, but um, <laughs> right now we're not too sure about that, but we are now at level, uh, level funding. And then an update on the CARES Act. Um, the city of Brockton has put in, will be putting in for more than $16 million um, in reimbursement for the CARES Act. I think it's gonna, they're gonna go up close to 20 when this is all said and done. And over $13 million of that is for, school, is for the school department. So as the mayor, Troy Clarkson, Aldo, we meet every week, we talk about this. Um, we, we put every expense forward that can be reimbursed by the CARES Act money. And again, we are continuing to do that. And uh, again, we thank the mayor, uh, the city council, the school committee, Troy Clarkson and Aldo for their hard work in this area. Um, we were hoping maybe for another stimulus package from the federal government that would give us some more money, but I don't think that's going well. So we'll just have to continue to get by. Um, again, we were hoping for some student opportunity Mac Act money. We're hoping for some f more federal money to come in. Right now, that doesn't look like it's going to happen anytime soon. So, again, uh, we're thankful for the Plymouth County and the CARES Act money, and and we're going to rely on that reimbursement. Obviously, any questions about the budget? Uh, not really the budget. Can I just go back? Um, you had mentioned about the power outages and things yep. like that. So actually, last week Ward Six, we did experience a power outage. It's still a learning process, um, trying to get used to this new remote learning. Um, so one of my schools did not have electricity. So I received some calls, we reached out to the superintendent um, and we took care of things. But is there any way we can put like some kind of an alert on our BPS website? Because a lot of parents didn't know what to do. We can't log on, we don't know what to do. Just something that if they, if, it, honestly, the power outage was at Brookfield, and it was Ward 6, but it also affected my high school students, my middle school students that um, live in Ward 6 and go to other schools. So it would, that's, It's going to be a text message. Yeah, if we that can... Um, that's the, just the putting on the internet, if they don't have power, wouldn't help yes. them, but we, we, would, we would send a text message. Again, it's, it's how quickly we're notified of the outage. And then we try to get the information out, but it would definitely the most efficient way will be a text message than a phone call. Because it does take time to upload yep. thousands of telephone numbers, exactly. as you had indicated. But I do notify all principals, let them know where the outages are, let them know that if students lived in the Brookfield area, there was also parts of the west side, I believe, that were out up near the Han even though the Hancock School had power, the neighborhoods around the Hancock didn't have it. So we let the principals know through an email that please understand that some of your students at every level uh, might have issues logging in because of no power, but a text message will go out to the whole district to let okay. them know. Okay. All right, because I know a lot of them are going on to um, social media asking, looking for, for things, whether it's our BPS Facebook page, just looking for some direction. Until we get used to this new norm, um, just so parents know what to do, especially if we're expected to have more bad weather, yeah. um, just so they know where to look. Um, you know, and, and if any of us get those text messages, screenshot them, post them on our, our pages. Um, as constituents are always looking for a little bit of direction until we can figure out. We're learning, yep. we're learning. I think you're doing a great job. So we're learning and um, it should be interesting come winter time. <laughs> oh yeah, but no snow days. No snow days, those days are <laughs> over. <laughs> no canceling days. Um, and then any other, any questions about the budget before I move on to, so uh, the district review, um, the state DESE will be coming on during our next official school committee meeting, which is Tuesday, October 20th, um, to present the district review that was done back the week of March 3rd of 2020. Um, as they do this district review every six years, uh, it was done in 2013. 
uh, when Kathy Smith first took over as superintendent, and then obviously six years later, um, um, I took over as superintendent. And they, it's not, it doesn't mean they always come in when someone new takes over. It's just the way that the timing goes. It's every six years. So, um, so the next time to come was this past March. Um, that review um, they'll be presenting to you. I will provide that to you before um, the meeting, and um, they'll make that public, um, in, I think, that day, the um, Tuesday the 20th, and then an associate commissioner will be here um, to present that information to you on, uh, on October 20th. And I'll, I'm going to ask that we actually make the meeting, if we could change the time of the meeting um, earlier that night, um, to accommodate the Department of Education. So um, I think I have to do that on the new business. Thank you. Any questions? Or? And then I just want to remind our families and, uh, again, thank uh, our food and lunch service providers. Um, they um, have always, as you know, have been great. Um, we really are encouraging our families to go and get the grab and go meals at 17 locations now. Um, from 3 to 6 p.m., they get a meal for that day, and they also get a meal for the next day, so students don't have to leave their house and go out and get lunch. We went from uh, 3,000 lunches, now we're up to 6,000, which allowed us, again, we, unfortunately, we had to furlough uh, several of our food service um, employees. Um, we were able to bring some back because now we went up to 6,000 meals. If we can get back to 10,000 meals a day, we would be able to bring all our food service workers back. As you know, their uh, salaries are funded by the reimbursement we get from the state and the federal government. Um, so we really encourage our families to take advantage, not, not only to help bring our food service work, but it is, it's, it's a really good program. It provides meals for families that need it. Um, everybody is eligible to go and get a meal because we are full free um, lunch district. Um, and if you can't leave your home, uh, a neighbor can pick it up for you. Um, the child does not, the student does not have to be present. Um, a neighbor can lend a hand, uh, a friend, a relative can go pick up the meal and just say, I need meals for four or five students or one. Um, and you'll get those meals to take to the family, uh, the, the students in need. Um, and again, please take advantage of that. Usually during the school year, when we're in person, we serve about 12,000 meals a day. Um, right now, we're, again, we're back up to 6,000. And again, if we can get back to 10,000, um, we could bring all our workers back. And it's just, again, it's a great program. Again, 17 locations that are on our website, which is pretty much every school in the district, except for the ones that are right across the street from each other. And again, that's from 3 to 6 p.m. Uh, again, we, did, we made that change in time to accommodate families, especially our working families. And then just a reminder um, to make sure you complete the 2020 census. Our numbers are going up, so uh, people are, um, have signed up. I think we're, um, we're up to, I don't know how, what the percentage is now, but we're in the last push for the 2020 census, which is very important for funding, federal funding for the city of Brockton. So we really encourage people now that there's a computer, every student has a computer to go online and complete the 2020 census, and hopefully we can have 100% of um, Brockton families complete that, because it would mean a, a big increase in funding for not only education, for health care, um, for roads, for infrastructure for the city. So again, please go online and complete the 2020 census. And that's it for me, Mr. Minichello. Okay, wonderful. Um, items to refer to subcommittee. So you mentioned a policy subcommittee you needed for next Tuesday? Okay. 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 Right. All right. So well, that's okay. And believe me, I'm worse than that. That's neat. Okay. So um, we previously had a, a scheduled superintendent's contract subcommittee for six for next Tuesday. So. Um, the recommendation of the superintendent is to move that to the 7 o'clock spot to have a curriculum subcommittee that evening at 6 p.m. 
is, is that uh, workable for the members here um, for a curriculum sub for next Tuesday at 6 and then a superintendent's contract subcommittee at 7? Will that work? Do we, um, can we, we're going to have to fit the policy one in. So do you want to do 7, 6, then 6.30 for policy sub and then 7.30 for the... Just so we can talk about the numbers next week, I think it's important that we get that in. Do you think you a half an hour is enough for the curriculum sub from six to six thirty? Yeah, I don't. I mean, it will be discussion. I mean, we'll have the, um, I'll have the discussion um, with. Um, it has to. It's a draft, and I have to have obviously a negotiations, which we'll have this okay. week. So, um, so, so you'd like we'll curriculum that, sub so I at think we can six. Do a half hour. Policy at six thirty, and then superintendent. At 7.30, is that what you're? Yeah. Okay, yeah. does that work for everyone? Okay, so, the, so be it. Ms. Campbell, if you could accommodate that, and then we would like to, um, I, I think we'll need to have a, a vote of the committee to start on the, uh, what is it, the 20th? Yep. Superintendent? You, he'd like a start time of 6.30 for that school committee meeting because it'll be a, uh, a little longer meeting because of the DESI people coming in. So um, can we have a motion to uh, change the start time on the October 20th from 7 to 7.30 for that school committee meeting? 6.30. 6.30. Yes, 6.30 from 7 or 7 to 6.30. Whichever oh. way you like it. Motion to change the October 20th school committee meeting from 7 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. A second? second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Okay, so done. All right, well, that's all set. One question, Tom, on the 13th. Certainly, Mr. Sullivan. The, the, all those meetings are going to be right here on the 13th? All those meetings will be right here. Okay. Okay, excellent. Um, any unfinished business? <clears throat> Any new business? Anything going on that people would like people to know about? Actually, I'll make it quick. Um, so I, with everything going on with the pandemic, I haven't had a chance to distribute the backpack safely. So starting this Friday, um, if everything goes well on Thursday, we're gonna be putting the backpacks together and the first distribution will be at the Brookfield School. Ms. Ramsey will have a call going out to the families and hopefully next week we'll have it at another school. So um, we have 2,000 backpacks that we're gonna be distributing once we have them. I can leave um, a good amount probably at Central as long as they're not in your way. If, if, if families wanna pick them up, they're more than welcome. Um, but we just need to coordinate it and just figure things out. We just gotta do it in a safe way as far as distributing them. And then um, Cradles to Crayons is also, um, going to be getting us our 500 winter jackets so those will be we'll pick those up within within probably about a week week and a half we're just waiting for those to come in um, and I, I would like to invite cradles to crayons to a meeting and maybe Absolutely. do something with the mayor's office um, if we look at everything they've given us over the six years five five and a half years I've been on the committee um, you know at least 2,000 backpacks a year over five, uh, probably 500 winter jackets the past two years. This year we'll make the third year we're getting the winter jackets. Uh, they've done a lot for the Brockton community, so I definitely would like to do something. It's really difficult during, you know, the pandemic, the COVID yeah. and everything, but at least acknowledge what they've given us. So if any of you have any constituents, just reach out to us um, and we will make arrangements to help out some of the families. Absolutely. We have it. We have the supplies. We have the jackets. Um, and they will be coming up shortly as far as the jackets. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. I mean, they're, they're really good to us. Absolutely. Um, so we got to do something special. Maybe next year. No, we, we were going to invite them to the state house and I know. COVID hit in March. So, but they've been very generous and given us a lot of stuff. Absolutely. So yeah. we will start distributing them this week. That's and great. Hopefully for the next few weeks. So volunteers. Okay, anyone else? You can't tell if anyone's smiling with these masks. <laughs> <laughs> You're always smiling, Ms. Azak, always. Anyone else? No, just a reminder to the community to please be vigilant when it comes to 
you know, wearing masks in public and out in buildings because um, it really does impact our students and, and our community because if in fact the numbers get too high, then we would be precluded from participating in athletics and other programs. Is that correct, Mr. Superintendent? So it might not be the students in the schools, but it could be the adults that are out there and those numbers, when they go up, have an impact on your school-aged children and your brothers and sisters and cousins and friends. So please understand that the numbers, if they go up and they get too high in the community, you basically preclude our kids from participating in the accepted sports that have been able to uh, participate due to the non-physicality of uh, of the, of the activity. Um, not every activity is gonna be going forward, but those that can will, so long as our numbers are acceptable. And then once we get bumped out, it's not like we can just shut it off for two weeks and then we get to participate again. You're done for that season, correct, Mr. Superintendent? Yeah, we so have to watch it closely. It's yeah. very important to be vigilant you know, sometimes you'll see people in a store and it's like, where the heck is their mask? Well, just understand that, you know, no one's really, uh, this isn't someone that wants to point fingers, but we have to be careful because our community is affected by this. So we all need to be diligent and vigilant. Absolutely. So yep. just a reminder, people, just a reminder. Um, anyone else? All right, um, so I have uh, Tom. Ms. Sullivan. Um, since we're talking about safety, um, I did have um, some parents that did report, um, even though Brockton Public is not in session, we do have school buses in the city that are going to Southeastern Regional, Norfolk Agricultural, and um, the Catholic schools, Cardinal Spellman and Trinity Catholic, and a couple of parents in Ward 5 did report that their children are waiting at bus stops, sometimes in the dark, for these high schools, and people are not being safe about their driving. Um, I mean, it is 30 miles an hour in the city, and some are not stopping, and there is students around walking to school and taking buses. So if we could just remind the public that we should be safe uh, and when we're driving in the a.m. and p.m. because there are schools in session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. Um, anyone else for new business? No. We do have um, some items that we need to discuss in executive session. So at this time, uh, I would announce. I'm sorry. Oh, this sorry. One item. Oh, okay. Oh, yes. All right. Okay, under new business, uh, we have our uh, every, every year at this time uh, in November, there is the uh, MASC, Massachusetts Association of School Committee Convention down at the uh, co uh, convention center in Hyannis. Well, guess what? It's going to be remote. It's not going to be in person. Surprise, surprise. So we need to uh, appoint a delegate, um, and I know that um, Mr. Diagostino uh, requested that he be the delegate. So if, uh, if anyone does not feel strongly about being the delegate for the school committee uh, in, in Brockton, I would nominate Mr. Diagostino if, unless anyone has an objection. No? Okay. So. I would nominate Mr. Diagostino. And then we do nominate an alternate. Um, and uh, this is basically uh, what happens is down at the uh, convention, there are items that need to be voted on e uh, every so often. So Mark would stand in for Brockton. And uh, if Mark is unable to attend, you know, unfortunately, things do happen. That's why I'm here tonight. And Mark, unfortunately, is recovering from a little bit of a, an illness. So. Um, so we do miss you, Mark. I'm sure you're tuning in. But uh, is, would anyone like to be the alternate? Come on, Mr. Sullivan. You're good at that. I nominate Mr. Sullivan to be the alternate. It's virtual this year. 
All right. Okay. You don't even have to drive to Hyannis. Perfect. Okay, so I nominate Mark D'Agostino as the delegate and Mr. Sullivan, Timothy Sullivan, as our alternate. I need a second, please. Second. Quick. Second. Before anyone changes their mind. <laughs> Any further discussion? All in favor? It's a done deal. Perfect. All right. That's getting the job done. Okay. Next, we do have Ms. Campbell. Am I all set? Can I go into executive session now, or is there something else I'm forgetting? Good to go. All right. So, the school committee uh, will be going into executive session uh, to discuss some items that uh, deal with negotiations. So, just want to announce to the public that we will not be coming back uh, and broadcasting on any more uh, school committee uh, routine business for the evening. So, after we go, can go into executive session, you can all tune out and watch something very entertaining on TV or read a good book. So um, at this point in time, I have to take a roll call vote with respect to going into executive session. So I will move to my left. Ms. Sullivan. Yes. Ms. Mendez. Mr. Rodriguez. Yes. Ms. Azak. Yes. Mr. Sullivan. Yes. Mr. Superintendent. Yes. <laughs> and myself, yes. So thank you all for attending. It's been a very fun evening. And we will, uh, we will see you back in another week for our subcommittee meeting. We are adjourned for regular school committee.